question of the Pythagorean concept of the soul. Tonight we wish to advance that a little further, developing from concepts of the 47th proposition and its right angle triangle. We have already learned from this figure that the symbolic design is not equilateral, but is a triangle of one right angle and two acute angles, with one side estimated as a unit of three, the second as a unit of four, and the hypotenuse as a unit of five. And with these together, constitute a most important number, for the sum of the square of these numbers is 50, and the sum of the square of the 3 and the 4 equals the sum of the square of the 5. Now with this formula, which probably will soon disappear in our thinking, but should nevertheless be kept in the background as a key to the entire subject. We must proceed to the fact that the Pythagoreans held certain secret and valuable keys to the mystery of the human soul. But these keys probably came from Asia and certainly were taught by the office and later after Pythagoras uh, passed to Plato and Socrates, and finally, well, rather beautifully systematized and summarized in the writings of Plutarch. Thus we begin with a field which has unusual vitality today because of our ever-increasing interest in psychology, which we have defined as the language of the soul. And from the Pythagoreans, we gather certain information which should be of interest to psychologists. And in most of the systems which have been developed in this field so far, there is a broad indication that these earlier sources have been neglected. And therefore, uh, that certain basic definitions, which not necessarily should be accepted, but which should certainly be considered, have not been given the weight or attention which they deserve. So we will proceed with certain aphorisms of the Pythagoreans concerning the nature and structure of the soul. First of all, uh, the ancients recognized a triune nature in man, so that in the mysteries, the goddess Demita is made to say, death makes two out of three. This is a peculiar statement, but indicates that at death, a part of the triad or trinity of the human personality is lost, or is cast aside leaving two parts. Now in our Western theology, we are inclined to think of these two parts as spirit and soul. But this was not the Pythagorean approach. Because actually the Pythagoreans did not consider spirit as a part of the human personality. They regarded it as something far transcending an individual state of man. Therefore, that the personality with its three natures, or three parts, was sus suspended in a universality which is life or spirit. But that man himself, apart from spirit, had three natures by which he functioned and manifested, and by which he was reduced from three to two by the phenomenon of death. Thus, to quote Plato, the soul 
is the most ancient of generations and is the leader of all motions in the universe. So this is an interesting statement and we must begin by examining this. As the leader of all things that are created, and as the most ancient of things, Plato meant to imply, by things, forms, natures, or bodies, having separate existences. Under this definition, the soul is the superior of things, being the highest kind of form, nature or body, and that within this nature or body is resident the principle of motion, whether that motion be quantitative or qualitative. When that motion is applied to body, it becomes quantitative motion. When it is applied to understanding or to the higher faculties of the mind, it is called qualitative motion. Therefore, as Plato points out, motion may be a movement of the psychic nature, for the soul is a self-moving being, capable of moving that which is inferior to its own nature. By this same thinking, the Greeks affirm the soul to be the mistress of the body and the direct source of the phenomena which manifest through the body. Plutarch, following in the ancient past, insisted that all things about the body which have qualitative or quantitative significance are due to the activity or motion of soul. Therefore, if we say a person is a fine person, we are applauding the motion of his soul. If we say that he's nasty, we are also criticizing the motion of his soul. For in all things by which he manifests, in pain or pleasure, in virtue or vice, in knowledge or ignorance, he is revealing qualitative soul motion. All motion of this kind being some kind of a movement within a field of quality or a field of energy. The soul, according to the Greek, therefore, was primarily and fundamentally a being. And because it is called a being, it is separate from and dependent upon being itself. A being is a creature or a creation, and all things that are created are created from a previous state and ultimately return to it again. And that which is the root of all creation is the uncreated state which, however, possesses within itself the shadow and image of the world soul. Therefore, being moving into manifestation moves because of soul energy within itself. For things remain forever the same, whether in God or in the earth, unless they are changed by the soul. In this Pythagorean approach, therefore, we have the soul as mistress of body and as the servant of that which is unembodied, that which is itself an eternal and real nature. The Greeks further affirm that in the order of creation, those things which are superior were created first, and those things which were not superior were created afterwards. Therefore, those creations which are most uh, primary and most similar in nature and substance to their cause are therefore superior and elevated, the soul being the first 
of creation is therefore most like the eternal and possesses certain attributes of the eternal. These attributes, however, are diminished because in this procedure, num numeration has already fallen into number and the soul exists by virtue of number. Now, why do we, the Pythagoreans say that the soul has an existence only because of number? They answer that the essential principle of the soul is motion. Therefore, all motion becomes susceptible to number. Where there is no number, there can be no estimation of motion. All things that move, move, move numerically. They move in some way, and we try to estimate that way. If they move for one, from one place to another, we measure distance. Or if they move from themselves, we measure velocity. All things that are moved, therefore, come under some form of mathematical estimation, because they must move in place or in nature, or in condition, they must therefore also have environment. And so, being a thing can only be a thing because somewhere there is an absence of that thing. The only being that cannot uh, be accompanied by the absence of itself is eternity in its own nature. Thus, to have most a thing must move. It must move in quantitative interval, which is called place or space. Or it must move in qualitative interval, that is, in condition, kind, or nature within itself. Motion being the primary attribute of the soul, per se, or in its own natural and inevitable nature. It is said in the rites of the old mysteries that the soul is a wanderer, that it is forever upon a road, it is forever traveling. And as Plotinus uh, for, uh, for, for tells us, the motion of this soul is wandering and staggering as though it were intoxicated or sick or ill. It is interesting because as we find out later, there is a reason for this erratic motion of the soul. The ancients, therefore, made up the triad of man with a body and two soul natures. There was a twofold soul. And this twofold soul represented the extensions of its own qualities. The soul, as the a being, was polarized, as all beings must be. Only that which is eternal being itself is without objectified polarization. The soul, then, has of itself two natures, and was termed by the Greeks either the rational or the irrational nature. Now, the soul, by, an, by the attainment of one of these polarities, uh, becomes responsible for certain agitations or activities. A soul is said to be rational if, by its own nature, it verges toward a superior state. It is said to be irrational if, by its nature, it verges toward an inferior state. Thus the soul, united with the mind or the, or the intellect, is commonly referred to as the root of understanding, and the soul, united with the body, is referred to as the root of passion. Now, the terms understanding and passion are not necessarily to be immediately uh, is, uh, differentiated as good or bad. Understanding may cover a very wide gamut, 
and is itself polarized into both good and bad. Passion also has a wide gamut and is polarized into good or evil. For example, joy is a passion of the soul and not necessarily to be regarded as evil. And uh, the feeling of the plotter is a kind of understanding which is a negative pole of the union of the soul and the mind. The difference of these polarities, therefore, lies essentially in the energies used by the soul. When the soul uses what is called intellective energy, its polarities develop on the plane of thought or of ratiocination of some kind. Or when the soul is united with the body, its energies move on the level of emotion. Therefore, we have a new set of polarities, thought and emotion which we recognize very commonly in psychology. Yet at the present time, many schools of psychological thinking do not differentiate between mental and emotional soul attributes. They consider them as both arising from a common thought. And they consider that uh, thought, perhaps, is moved by emotion, or emotion by thought. They do not recognize, as the ancients did, the two complete machineries or chemistries are involved in these polarities. Thus, we may say that the natural tendency of the soul in seeking wisdom or in seeking improvement is to ally itself with understanding and bestow motion upon understanding. So, understanding in motion is called the rational soul. Uh, when the soul verges towards body and motivates body, this motivation is called the irrational soul or the passional power of man. For passion is body moved by soul. Um, and the two polarities become rather clearly understandable as uh, we go further. Now, the body, according to the ancients, being corruptible of its own nature, must ultimately be restored to the elements from which it came, which are the earth. The soul, though having a greater and more intense life, was held by the Pythagoreans to have a certain corruptibility. A corruptibility, however, uh, which is to be measured, perhaps, more in the terms of Buddhist metaphysics, where in the nirvana we have the extinction of individuality, which corresponds at least to a degree with the death of the soul, or the death of the independent principle of volition or motion in the compound of man's nature. Thus, by the faith who becomes immovable, there is a certain transference of motion. And by uh, the physical exhaustions of life, there is another transference of, of motion or energy. The soul, by its own nature then, according to the Greeks, ultimately was dissolved into the substance from which it came. And the ancients affirmed that this substance was called the lunar essence. And that as bodies disintegrate into the earth, the soul disintegrates into the lunar field. That was their concept of it. And therefore we have a reason to understand or study uh, some of the ancient theories concerning the psychic nature of the moon and the even now recognized effects of lunar activity upon the psychic life of man and nature. Now, the ancients affirm that the soul in man becomes thus polarized as rational and irrational. But in other creatures which are not human, soul as motion or energy bestows a number of attributes. In the plant kingdom, the Greeks recognize what is called the vegetative soul. And the vegetative soul has one primary motion, which is growth. 
and therefore all plants and things grow and unfold. In the animal world, the ancients recognized also a soul power, which they called the generative soul. For the peculiar power of animal life to them was the multiplication of species and the projection and extension of, of uh, forms of life. Therefore, Pythagoras declared the eighth part of the soul to be the power of generation. In the um, human life of man, the soul also plays a series of compound roles. For the mineral soul, which is the principle at the base of the inorganic structures of nature, operates through certain chemical fields within the human body, resulting in the structure and development of bones and other mineral parts of man. The vegetative soul controls growth, and in the case of both nature and man, controls another important psychic field, namely color. And we have the a tremendous diversity of color, which is also a form of the soul energy. Lord Bacon writes an essay on the colors of good and evil, and this is a, a well-taken point. For that which on one level may be color, may on another level be vice or virtue. After all, these energies are working through fields appropriate to their own natures. In the animal world also, we find that the soul has moved from the principle of growth to the principle of independent motion. Therefore, we have the motive soul in man likewise by which the body is able to move and to fulfill uh, the various phases of activity, such as those trades and crafts requiring the skillful use of the body, or in the case of the athlete, in the training and disciplining of the body. The soul, then, has all of these attributes, and the Egyptians likewise recognize that motion and emotion have a common root in man's psychic life. The soul of its own nature being of a pure motion, if it moves in an unformed field, this motion is infinite. But the moment the field is limited, this motion is directionalized or caused to proceed in some direction following one of the mathematical formulas of crystallization. So in the Greek thinking, and in the Pythagorean thinking particularly, and this also follows very far in the Socratic dialogue, the individual is regarded at this stage of his growth as coming into the world with a soul, a soul which by its nature and, and propensity may have three kinds of life simultaneously. It may have its own life, which is pure motion. And on a plane above body, as we know it, this motion, though not absolutely infinite, is vastly greater than anything we can comprehend. This soul, however, immersed in body, intoxicated by body, having taken of the drink of the waters of Lucy, or the waters of forgetfulness, and having be become filled with the toxin of body, is then said to wander erratically, not only about the world, but about the body, causing a variety of stimuli, some of which are reasonable and some unreasonable. Also, the soul in this state of uh, pauper, this state of involvement, is said to have entered into a sea of humidity, which explains the Greek statement that a dry soul is wise. This thought is a little difficult for us to explain immediately, but the Greeks declared that the physical earth was surrounded by a kind of field of etheric humidity. 
that this humidity was like a strange quicksand, and anything that fell into this sphere of humidity inevitably moved on downward into generation and birth. Therefore, the soul which was once dampened by the humidity of generation was required to be born. So Heraclitus observed that if the soul was wise enough to keep dry, it would not have to be born. Uh, this may have some consolation to the prohibitionist. <laughs> In any event, the soul having descended into generation, becomes, as it were, a principle of motion or energy within the body. It therefore extends outward through the body, producing innumerable manifestations. We find what we term evolution to be merely the ideation of the soul's energy. It is a constant motion qualitative or quantitative. The process from birth to old age is motion. The problem of hunger and the digestion of food are motion. Everything, including the beating of the heart, is motion. And this motion is made possible because of the vitality of the soul. It's because of its residence in proximity to the body makes possible the animation of form. If the soul is thus immersed within the body, held there in this torpor, or caught in this curious quicksand of generation, this primordial elus, or slime, which of course is the root of the word helium, and which in turn is the story of the Trojan War, all of these uh, mysteries of the Greeks has to do then with the, with the two procedures. One is the involvement of the soul in generation, and the other is the release of the soul from the principle of generation. That which is the descent is normally called generation. And in the case of man, the ascent is called regeneration which implies not only a return to a superior condition, but the attainment of a superior state or qualitative motion. Therefore, in the ancient line of thinking, the fall of man was considered to be one kind of motion, and the regeneration of man another kind of motion. Man being born into this world at some stage of his great cycle of activity is therefore endowed with a soul by means of which certain motions and emotions are possible to him. One of the most primary of the essential motions of the soul is its pendulum-like swing between extremes. And these extremes represent either the rationalization of man or his gradual descent into a more animalistic or bestial state. In the positive motion of the soul, we have involved a principle which the Greeks call the principle of pure intellect. And the principle of pure intellect, in its completeness and in its essential nature, was considered almost, if not entirely, synonymous with being itself, because being was absolute intellect. But on the level of human power, human ability, the most positive achievement within man is the polarization of intellect. Now, this means quite a little a different thing from what we uh, commonly think of as, for instance, union with divine mind or something of that nature. To the Greek, the intellect was something uh, which was partly at least dependent upon the soul and the body. Now, the Greeks did not consider intellect in the sense that we might use this term in a depreciating way to represent merely mental agility. Uh, a 
concept of intellectualism is not implied. Rather, by intellect is here understood a statement of the apperception of the workings of the universal mind itself. Man, therefore, has within him a potential, a seed of capacity uh, to think with theory, to think with God, to think the thoughts of God. But this potential lies dormant in him because it must be energized. And the only way in which it can be energized is through the power of the soul, because the soul wakes it up, gives it power, gives it purpose, and variously, as Plato says, agitates it. If it is not so agitated, it remains only seminal or seed like. The same is essentially true of body, because body is a seed likewise, this seed existing in a condition which we call matter. If the soul verges toward the body, it energizes the seed of body, producing what we may term the growth of bodies or forms. Of these forms, there are two kinds, one being termed rational forms and the other irrational forms. Rational forms are those which have within themselves, when developed, certain powers of knowing. Irrational forms are those which, when developed, become bodies, but are not of themselves rational. And the human body is regarded as an irrational form, because while it may have and does have kinds of mind within itself, and each of its cells contains an intellectual seminal unit, the body as a totality, when perfected and matured, is still not self-governing. The body of itself is a shell, a wandering thing, and without being in soul, it is mindless, or soulless, or beingless. It is a moronic thing. It is a mongoloid type of thing, something that has no purpose. As we observe when for any reason the mind is diseased or destroyed, with it it departs the grandeur or the nobility which crowns and uh, makes important the fact of the body itself. So the soul, by the processes of generation, has been required and as part of its natural function. It energizes body, strengthens it, matures it, develops it, and brings it to its various faculties and dimensions, giving it also within itself a sensitive field, a field of neuronic energy, or the power of the nervous system. And this field, and this wonderful tutoring and care by the soul, causes the body to achieve a state of utility, a state of value, a condition in which this body has not only its outer form, but a series of inner incentives. To achieve this purpose, soul unites itself with the principle of body, in so doing, voluntarily sacrificing its own nature. In this union with body, therefore, it becomes immersed or absorbed in body, and is released again through the growth of body. Thus, what we call growth is always not an expenditure of energy, but a release of energy. And things by growing do not become weaker, but become stronger. And where growth is normal, nothing is exhausted by growth itself. 
that which is called the termination of growth, is brought about by a transition in the psychic polarity of the soul. For when the soul has brought or led, as it is said, the body to a certain state, then the soul, having fulfilled its proper function, turns its attention to other things, and therefore ceases to increase the size or power of the body. Thus at maturity, does, it does not mean that the principle of growth is exhausted, but that the polarity of growth is changed, so that from maturity on, growth moves by a qualitative motion within the body, causing a growth of character, a growth of understanding, a growth of beauty, whereas previously it was concerned primarily with the enlargement or strengthening of the body. The soul normally, then, reaches its fulfillment to bodily tasks at what we call maturity or majority. At that time, theoretically, the soul has built a body suitable to itself. If the soul remains associated with the bodily principle beyond this time, that which is its palace slowly becomes its tomb. That which it has created uh, becomes its prison unless the soul is able to achieve a proper transition from a material to a, a metaphysical polarization. Now in the growth then of the soul itself through the development of the body, the Pythagoreans observe the various powers that are manifested through man at various stages of his growth. By birth, one power of the soul is revealed. And this power of the soul carries through the integration of the body. At the so-called seventh year, the soul passes into its vegetative power and the body increases rapidly in size following the principle of growth. At the fourteenth year, the soul enters into its animal state, intensifying the emotional life of the individual and increasing fertility and the power to reproduce its species. As the majority, the soul is said to be joined to the mind, and by so doing, to cause the rise of the intellective nature. Now, this is a beautiful little pattern, only it doesn't always happen. And there are individuals whose souls, because of the <coughs> destiny, or Plato says the whole world moves upon the spindle of Nemesis. Uh, destiny doesn't always permit or does not by organic quality release the soul at proper time and under proper conditions. And the Greeks affirm that this release has to be accomplished many times and the probability of the individual attaining it in any one life determines on the practice. It is determined by the practice he has already had in previous lives. If it is the habit of the soul to be released at majority, it will be. If this is the first time it is trying to be, it may have quite a little difficulty making it. But in any event, the soul, by nature, therefore, devotes a certain time, a certain part of its own nature, to the perfection of body. And in this work, it builds body according to formula. And body prior to a development of the internal rationality was by the ancients not regarded as a, a self-responsible agent. And all creatures in which there is no conscious union between the soul and the mind are not held to be responsible for conduct. Therefore, small children were not so held because they lacked what we term maturity. The soul passing into its natural development, therefore, then goes on to follow through another cycle of 28 years, which constitutes its birth, growth, adolescence, and maturity on a mental level so that the complete 
the uh, development of the being is supposed to require twice twenty eight years. Uh, by the time of this uh, double cycle, uh, the soul is said to have not only ensouled the body, but to have ensouled the mind or the power of reason, and to have brought the nature to understanding. Therefore, 21 is the age of voting, and twice 20, uh, 21 is uh, 28 rather is considered the full development of the body, and twice that is the age of psychic majority. The 21, of course, is the beginning of the mental cycle, which lasts for seven years and terminates at 28. But twice this is supposed to be the birth of understanding, or the second maturing of the individual. In this concept, of course, we then affirm or assume that having completed its processes with the outer nature, the soul then takes over the generation of the inner life. This generation is the positive pole. The soul is now verging toward understanding. Under normal conditions, assuming that there were no pressures, no unreasonable obstacles presented of an artificial nature. The Greeks were of the opinion that the soul, properly and normally permitted to function, would in twice 28 years bring the individual to a balanced condition of internal and external living. Opposed to this process, however, we have the incidental or accidental circumstances of life. We have systems of culture. We have industrial concepts. We have numerous and countless restrictions placed upon the normal growth of the soul. Now, whence come these restrictions? Why do we have them? Well, they in themselves are motions, whether they are releasing or binding motions. And no institution or no system or no thought, no religion, no philosophy can exist in the world without existing by virtue of the soul. Thus the Greeks were of the opinion that when the soul, having achieved a certain majority, is then not released, is not tutored and aided, is not supported, it may then not make this transition from one state of growth to another, and instead of moving upward, moves again downward, and uniting itself with a now highly organized body, produces a series of manifestations which we term materialism. Materialism being the energies of the soul held in bondage to objectivity, not permitted to continue in their normal process of internal improvement. It was for this purpose and to meet this need that what we call today education came into existence. Education was originally reserved to the temple. It was that part of man's life which was devoted to the conscious program of growing up as a person rather than as a body. The body grew up and usually requires a certain amount of assistance in this procedure. In this process, the child is assisted parentally. He is also given certain social opportunities. He is cared for, he is guarded, he is fed, he is clothed. And he is encouraged to achieve that kind of education which will adjust him for a physical existence. <laughs> Therefore, he reaches majority with certain skills or aptitudes suitable to maintain his livelihood. 
But when it comes to the second great cycle of years, the second period of 28 years, not only is the child without parental guidance, but usually is without guidance from itself. Furthermore, in the world as we know it, no opportunity of a suitable nature, sufficiently attractive to the soul, are offered by means of which the individual should, can recognize and should recognize his life after his 28th year as a new cycle of self-growth. He assumes that by the time he has worked his way to the university and perhaps gotten his master's and his doctorate, he's had education enough. He has, as far <coughs> as that part of his nature which is the compound of soul and body. The compound of soul and body, he has, a, by the time he finishes the university, as he knows it, achieved a full measure of education. But the ancients pointed out what we are beginning to learn, namely, that this young person can leave the university and five years later be a hopeless neurotic. In other words, he may also become a delinquent, he may become a criminal. And perhaps being more fortunate than this, he may simply be miserable for the next 50 years. Uh, he may not have any serious symptoms, but neither does he show any serious symptoms of improvement. He just goes along living haphazardly, feeling that he is schooled, he is educated, and therefore that it is up to him now to build his life. He does this without understanding, without wisdom, without direction, and without adequate incentive to these things, just being the most important factor of all. The Pythagoreans recommended two ways in which the soul could be released uh, from bondage, a perpetual bondage, to body. And the state of bondage of this kind is somewhat parallel with our concept of the perpetual adolescence, the individual who grows old but never grows up, uh, a situation that is very frequent and sometimes causes us to wonder how human beings do as well as they do and last as long as they seem to last. Uh, the Pythagoreans advocated what they called the discipline of silence as being very useful to the maturing of the soul. Now, silence was a discipline with them in which they imposed five years without speech. And strangely enough, it is reported there were about 60 women who achieved discipleship <laughs> on this basis. A rather unusual and uh, highly commendable state of affairs. The uh, discipline of silence was largely to deprive the individual of a large number of hypnotic circumstances which held him uh, to uh, materiality. Not the least of these hypnotic circumstances being the other fascination of his own voice. Uh, when an individual says something, what he says goes around and goes in his ears again, and he it receives strange authority in passing. By the time he hears it, he almost believes it. And if he says it three or four times, he is certain of it. It sounds perhaps facetious, but it is nevertheless true that we have talked ourselves into more things than we will ever realize. The second point in connection with the discipline of silence was that it was not limited to vocal activity. It was a symbol of the attainment of internal quietude or relaxation within the the psychic field of the body. The purpose of this relaxation was to give the soul an opportunity to assert its own motion, recognizing 
that by quieting the pressures by which the soul is bound to body, the soul could restore its own equilibrium. Thus, by reducing the tension of living, reducing the tension of emotion and thought, and thereby not constantly focusing the psychic nature upon the body, it could be assisted uh, to develop a greater and more independent nature. Now the soul, as we say, is not only uh, a motion, as we know it, but a constant focalizing of motion. A good example on a very simple level of what we are talking about is the individual who uh, discovers that he has uh, a peculiar pain somewhere. The moment he focuses his attention upon that pain, it will increase because he will gather psychic energy and create an intensification of the pattern. A singer becoming throat conscious will almost immediately develop a dry throat and be unable to sing well. Wherever we focus attention, we create tension. And where our entire life is focused objectively, we create a tremendous objective tension. We focus every resource that we have on whatever we are doing. If our one great dream in life is to be the head of a large business, we will focus every bit of attention upon this. And gradually we bind the psychic energy and make a slave of it. In other words, we take the soul, which is a being superior to body, and we chain it in servitude to body, making it a slave of objectivity alone. If we are successful in one pointing this psychic energy until it becomes a tremendously intensive force, we are termed especially successful. Because when we do that, then nothing can stop us. And we are going to succeed because we have determined to succeed. So we gradually develop into outstanding successful failures. Our digestion goes, our friends leave us, our relatives can't live with us, but we are a success. So we have ulcers, and we have nervous breakdowns and we go to a premature end because we have been so wonderfully successful in being unnatural, being abnormal, or perhaps more correctly, if not quite so flatteringly, subnormal. For as long as the soul's energy is directed into body alone, we are subnormal. In this also, we recognize what is termed the passional power of the soul. Because once it is intoxicated by body, it becomes a tremendous, blind, driving force, which we call ambition. And ambition is a motion. Ambition is a tremendous psychic energy. And this energy drives like a heartless taskmaster. And this energy drive is a phase of the suffering or condition of the deluded soul. The soul, having been captured, having been intoxicated, having lost all vision and the perspective, releases its energies in these erratic pressures. And we have all of the different fields of uh, psychoneurotic uh, difficulty and even uh, psychic disease. Because the soul, not being permitted to be what it was intended to be, becomes sick. All energies or powers which are not used according to the laws governing their usage are said to be abused. 
And if they are refused, they rebel. And ultimately, the wrong use brings the entire compound to the solution. If, on the other hand, when the soul has attained equilibrium within the body, and has brought the body to maturity, uh, according to Plato then, the soul becomes the mistress of the body, becomes its leader, becomes its goddess, is the one to whom, like the mystic troubadours of old, all the love songs of the uh, minstrel uh, were written. The soul becomes the dark lady of the Shakespearean sonnet, becomes the mysterious dark virgin of King Solomon's song. It is this mysterious beloved, thought always by the uh, various Arabic sects, uh, such as the Dervishes and the Sufis and the Druzes and all of these groups. The soul then finds or should find the body at its feet, adoring it, and uh, recognizing it as the Virgin Sophia, uh, the great mother of the body and the great guide and guardian of the body. And the soul, of course, in its own proper nature, is symbolic of the sanctuary, of the ecclesia, the church, the cathedral, the temple, the mosque. All these are soul symbols, symbols of internal sanctuary. The soul, having thus achieved its proper purpose, and presuming, which is not very generally so in these days, uh, that it has reached its equilibrium, having achieved that which is necessary for the body. The soul then verges upward uh, toward union with understanding, or toward union with the rational part of the nature. In so doing, achieving uh, the vitalization and motivation of the inner life of the being. Now, we have to pause for a moment uh, to discover something more about the nature of the soul. Because in uh, the Greek and also later in the Neoplatonic mysticism, uh, the soul's position in its own essential nature was very important to this discussion. In the great Platonic triad of the one, the beautiful, and the good, uh, the soul is the beautiful because it is motion. And motion, according to the ancients, rhythmic motion was the most abstract and perfect symbol of beauty. The soul of itself generates from it nothing dissimilar to itself. The soul as the first of beings, the most perfect of generations, therefore of its own nature, does not generate dissimilar, but is one of those ineffable blossoms suspended from being, which become the source of beauty and of order and of harmony in the world. The influence of the soul even upon body is to bring it to normalcy, to health, to equilibrium, to growth, to manifestation, so that the healthy body is even to the artist the most beautiful of all forms in nature, the most uh, perfect because it is not only a magnificent unity, but it is also a transcendent beauty. And being beautiful, it is necessary. And being necessary, it is beautiful. Because all beauty flows to the fulfillment of necessity. And that which is absolutely sufficient to its own need is beautiful. This was another rule of the 
because that which is sufficient must in all of its parts be related uh, symmetrically, uh, aesthetically, and harmoniously. So we know that the lower power of the soul, when transmuted and transformed, that somewhat is called the generative or irrational phase of the soul, comes the supreme irrationality and emotion. So in this, we have the power of the soul, even in its generative polarity. We have then the concept of the soul as the beautiful. And if love is the emotional polarization of beauty on its highest and most complete perfection, so the most odious and terrible of the emotional perversions of the soul is hate. Hate representing merely uh, the complete irrational or intoxication of the emotion of the soul itself. Therefore, hate is associated with the toxin of body, and the Greeks insisted that no being out of a body could hate. It is a thought, at least, because it is the combination of the absorption of the psychic energy in the conflict of environment, resulting in loss or gain, adjustment or non-adjustment, the false developments of competition and comparison and all of these things which make hate possible. So hate is the final ignorance of the emotional polarity of the soul. If then the soul is beautiful, and of its own nature is always beautiful, then in its various levels it bestows itself under normal conditions. Mind may be selfish. Mind may be devoted to innumerable, uh, unreasonable opinions, beliefs, and ideas. If the psychic energy is used to vitalize these, then we have just the same situation on the mental level that we have uh, when the soul vitalizes uncontrollable passions on the physical level. It therefore follows that as the soul must build and does build its bodily house, so over great periods of time it must build its internal or intellective house. <coughs> and this is where we get back again now, having described our problem of beauty, to this little matter of education which we started on. The Greeks, particularly, held that there were two complete systems or structures of education. And Comenius, uh, in relation to the establishment of this Pantothic University, which became the basis of our present public school system, uh, emphasized this point also, but not strongly enough for modern educators to have remembered it. He said, for example, uh, that the child goes to school, learns to become a person. The mature individual associates himself with a teacher, a master, a scholar, and devotes the second part of his life to the improvement of this inner part of him. Pythagoras in his school at Crotona, for example, did not teach children. He brought adults together, put them in the first grade, and started them out again. He did it not because he went over the common lessons that they had learned before, but he put them into the first grade of another system, a higher order of learning, which was essential for the cultivation of the superior being within themselves. Thus as the child learns its letters, and its the so-called three A's, many of which are not well taught today, by the way, the 
a groomed disciple going on into the ways of wisdom entered into the, what the Greeks and later the Germans called the gymnasium and there they went on and learned the mature philosophies of adult living. There they began the study of philosophy. There they began to recognize the need for becoming acquainted with the purpose for themselves and the destiny which they were intended by the universe to attain. For as our education of children is <coughs> just the child to make a living in the world, so the education beginning in the temple and in the mystery school and in the schools of the great teachers adapted the adults to build a life in the universe, to build a full and complete statement of himself. Such a procedure is entirely contrary to our thinking, but based upon that procedure, Greece in the period of about 300 years contributed more creative thinkers and great founders of knowledge to the world than probably any other nation in twice the same length of time. There were probably more Greek creative thinkers alive at one time in Athens in the 4th century B.C. than there have been in the entire history of European thought in the last 500 years. Because one list alone of really great outstanding thinkers among the Greeks went to over 300. And each one of these made a basic contribution to human knowledge, whereas today we are simply building upon those foundations and reforming, revising, and amplifying a wee bit. But who today is inventing arithmetic, geometry, biology, or physics? That was done in those good old days, which we look upon as benighted and extremely limited. But in the concept of the disciplines involved, the soul moving gradually towards the positive polarity must overcome step by step uh, the limitations of the untutored mind. Now, as Confucius pointed out, if the soul only had ignorance to contend with, it would be a simple matter. But it has something infinitely worse than ignorance, and that is wrong knowledge. Uh, if the individual doesn't know, we can teach him. But if he doesn't know he doesn't know, it is more difficult. And if he is fully convinced that that which he knows is right, and it is not right, he is most difficult of all. <laughs> so to the average person, most true learning is unlearning. Getting rid of that which is not so. There is an energy is fed into an instrument that is moving and operating like a machine, and fuel is given to it it will continue to run according to the pattern that it has been following. And the soul energy moving into a corrupted intellectual nature, all one immature and insufficient, produces another series of phenomena. And we have all kinds of perver perverse, destructive intellects, ranging perhaps from the simple, selfish individual uh, to some uh, outstanding example of human arrogance and egoism uh, like Adolf Hitler or somebody like that. All of these represent energy moving through an inadequate vehicle, moving through and involved in the toxin of the mind. Thus the purification and regeneration of the intellect is a slow and difficult path and results in the in, infinitude of different degrees of mind which we find everywhere in the world. Because, according to the Greeks, and I think it is true, when all men reach the perfection of their intellect, they will have identical thoughts. Because they will then be capable only of universal thought, which is identical, and can have no diversity or division within it. 
Therefore, all difference of opinion, while necessary at a given time, must ultimately lead to an absolute identity. And this is another Pythagorean theory, theorem also, namely, that all error differs, all truth is the same. And we agree to the degree that we share either a common knowledge or a common ignorance. Now, individuals can share a common ignorance and have agreement about that which is not so. But they may ultimately share a common wisdom and have agreement about that which is so. The soul continuing onwards in its path and gradually over a period of time gaining dominion over the intellect as it has previously gained dominion over the body finally establishes the state of maturity in the mind even as it establishes the state of maturity in the body now what is the state of maturity in the body the state of maturity is the power to reproduce directed and controlled by reason in other words maturity of the body means fertility of the body under discipline and in the uh, Greek thinking, maturity of the intellect was also fertility under discipline. In other words, anything which reaches maturity is capable of bearing life. And the final proof of maturity is to give life, to bear life. Therefore, the intellect. Uh, when it reaches maturity, becomes zero in its own level, and therefore is capable of bearing life. When the intellect bears life, we call it creativity. And when the body bears life, we call it generation. The intellect which is mature is capable of giving birth to ideas. Now, what does it mean by giving birth to ideas? Does it mean that the intellect actually is able <coughs> to fashion from that which is not a substance or a nature which is? This comes back to the old question in the first verse of Genesis. What did the gods create the universe out of? The answer, of course, is that creativity is not the creation of something from nothing, but the objectivity of things from no thing. In other words, from potential into potency. Because all ideas, all thought, all concepts, all creations, mental, emotional, or physical, of which man is capable, exist eternally in archetypal nature. Creativity is therefore man's rapport with archetypes, by means of which he is able to bring through some design or pattern which exists forever in the tracing of the divine mind. Thus, for example, before the time when man ever invented a locomotive, the concept or the laws governing that invention resided eternally in the divine nature, along with all the other ideas which we have not yet had, and which anyone may discover any moment. And one of the peculiar laws that we discover in the matter of ideas is that they are nearly always simultaneously released through by more than one person. And practically every invention that we have had and every step in science has been spontaneously generated in several places almost at the same time. So what we call creativity is the capacity to bring through into manifestation the archetypal patterns of the universal mind. And maturity, therefore, is the power of the intellect to create a mental body for the embodiment of a concept existing in the divine mind. Just as surely as in physical generation we do not create a being, 
You merely provide a body for a being. So the mind creates not eternal spirit any more than the generation by body does, but gives embodiment to eternal ideas. And of course, basically, a human being is an idea. It's just uh, a little different way of approaching the concept of archetype. This maturity is said to have been attained when the soul achieves to the point of understanding. Thus, understanding is the maturity, the second maturity of the human being. And who attains it is said to be twice born. Because he is given, perhaps, knowledge with his first birth, but understanding with his second birth. For knowledge permits him to live here and now. Understanding orients him forever, giving him a participation in an eternal existence. The soul, creating these patterns, then, bestows likewise its principle of beauty upon the mind. And, the, and when beauty is opposed or is imposed upon the mind, so that the mind is in all things symmetrical, harmonious, orderly, sequential, and without asymmetries within itself. It is said to be reason. Reason being in the perfect pattern within the state of mind. Because to be reasonable means to be harmonious on a level of mind. And reason in its purest nature is absolutely symmetrical. Without distortion within any of its parts. But the word reason is here used platonically, archetypally or ideally, not in our common daily usage of the term. People constantly talk about things being reasonable or unreasonable, but most of the remarks are unreasonable. But by pure reason, we mean that in which there is no defect of judgment. Therefore, there is no dishonesty. And what dishonesty is to the mind, deformity is to the body. So all of these are parallel, and the two processes move practically uh, on the same pattern, but on different levels of manifestation. The soul, which has thus become the instrument of understanding, now finds itself in the most complete and perfect state of which it is capable. For it not only governs the body, but also governs the mind. And having achieved government over both the mind and the body, it brings them together into an absolute harmony. And they become the two horses drawing the chariot of the goddess, because they are then pulling together which is impossible unless they are held or their reins are held by a third power. So the soul is regarded as then moving or manifesting itself according to its own nature. Now when the soul, having of its own being and nature an absolute symmetry, is thrown symmetrically in the compound of body and mind, so that it is manifesting its own qualities without restriction or limitation. That nature is then said to have achieved the beautiful, because it has then achieved the perfect expression of the force behind it, and has become a symbol or a design, an emblem. It, to use a scriptural term, bears perfect witness. And because it bears perfect witness, it reveals the soul in all of its splendor. And there are some very wonderful ancient hymns and songs to the gods and goddesses which describe this magnificent uh, achievement, this wonderful state of complete soul or psychic sufficiency. 
Having thus proceeded, we observe that the soul passes then through uh, the three essential conditions. First, being of its own nature, without polar polarization, as pure motion. Secondly, moving downward. Thirdly, moving upward. And finally, according to the Pythagorean doctrine, achieving once again equilibrium. Equilibrium being in this condition, or in this concept, a perfect balance of manifestation, in which neither the body nor the mind uh, are in a state of tyranny, nor do they tyrannize each other. All of the mental attributes, then, are resulting from the manifestation of soul energy through mind, the bodily attributes through body. These two groups of attributes must likewise be subject to great analysis, for as we know that sickness of the body will hamper the manifestation of the life within it. So we realize that abnormal state of the mind results in a sickness, and that this sickness means that the energies of the soul are distorted, and in so doing, these energies may become the sources of malignancy in the body and of disease in the mind because disease is just as much emotion of energy as health is. Disease is an energy moving against or upon restriction. And wherever there is an obstruction to the motion of physical energy, there is sickness. And wherever there is an obstruction to mental energy, there is a fixation or a complex and what we might term a boil or a bunion or something of that nature in the body will be correspondingly found as a fixation, a complex, or a center of neurotic pressure in the internal life of the individual. And just as various diseases may see by using energy for their own growth, and thus ultimately destroy the body. So attitudes, opinions, notions, um, wrong concepts may become vitalized until they devour, eat up, or expend all of the energy which should be devoted to the normal function and growth of mind. Energy, therefore, both creates and destroys. <coughs> And in the Egyptian and Greek religion, the soul, therefore, had its positive and negative appearances. It was not only a goddess of beauty and truth, but also a purely capable, when abused, of bringing a horrible vengeance with it. And this is one of the points that we are least likely to realize today, namely that we cannot abuse energy with impunity. That which we misuse or abuse must ultimately return in the form of an avenging deity, wrecking uh, our happiness and life. The term happiness is also associated with the soul, inasmuch as happiness is a, actually and essentially a comfortable state of the soul. Now, happiness is, for most persons, a passing mood. Well, we do not have it in any extended period of time, and we are taught to assume that it is best, though, because if we were happy all the time, we would probably do nothing and accomplish very little. We would simply enjoy ourselves from now on. For that reason, a moment of happiness is usually followed by some disquietude of one nature or another. But happiness theoretically, the happiness of philosophy, which is the byproduct of achievement, the happiness of philosophy arises again from lack of tension, from relaxation, order, and adjustment within the psychic life. So when the soul fits comfortably into its mental, emotional, physical pattern, it is said to be at peace. 
And when the soul is at peace, because it has no discomfort within its own functioning, the individual is said to be at peace. And we have a, a nice term for it, peace of soul. We're all looking for it. But the only way that the soul can be at peace is, is when the soul is comfortable because it is just as difficult for the soul to be happy uh, when uncomfortable as it is for an individual to be happy when walking around in shoes two sizes too small. And he is uncomfortable, and this discomfort destroys the natural equilibrium of his various parts. If, therefore, in the Greek philosophy we study this, we realize that what we call happiness comes not from the body, but from the soul. And therefore, that unless the soul is content, there is no security in life. And this brings us another term, security. And security likewise represents a quality of soul motion. That individual who turning within himself as the Greeks say, finds within that luminous power which is the first generation of being, and finding in that power a sufficient light and a source of eternal good, that individual is secure. And all security means to be able to turn inward and find sufficiency. So wherever there is insecurity, the individual is unable to commune with himself. And where he is unable to commune with himself, he must be insecure. There is no external power which can bestow security. We talk of security in old age, and then comes a depression. We talk about the security of our investments, and then comes a bomb. Uh, we talk about all kinds of securities, but we're talking about things that can pass in a few hours. The only security which exists is that in which the individual can live consciously in the company of his own soul. That means that when he turns within himself, he finds light, not darkness. He finds an adequate being and not an emptiness. He finds inspiration, guidance, counsel, and not merely a dark, strange fear. If the soul becomes so darkened by these pressures of body, or so completely immersed in mental or material matter that it is incapable of an independent function, its power may be so reduced that the individual looking in within himself becomes panic-stricken because he looks in and experiences the similitude of death. And the most dangerous and difficult of, difficult of all psychic problems to work with is the one in which the individual turning within himself finds death, finds darkness, so complete and so inevitable that he will say to himself, I believe I have already died as far as any reality within myself is concerned. But the Greeks also assure us that the soul cannot and does not die, but it treatment. And like Jephthah's daughter, it must be raised by the power of purpose, the power of enlightened wisdom. In the Christian mystery of thought, the Sota, or the Messiah, Christ, becomes the symbol of the universal soul and its redemptive power and its gradual ability to transform all things unto itself. And it is this soul power which, speaking through the words of Paul, says that if it is lifted up, it will raise all other things unto it. Now the soul, having thus a nature and a substance of its own, the Greeks believed was divisible from body, and that when motion and energy had energized all of the conscious powers of man, that the power of the soul was then gradually withdrawn, so that finally 
pure consciousness took over, and that the soul prepared the being for re-identification with its own inevitable root. Thus the soul was a ladder, also symbolized. And it was also the mysterious jewel of seven stars, because the ancients considered the solar system the symbol of the soul, with its seven planets. And they placed this in the middle distance between the earth below and the empyrean, or the sphere of the fixed stars above. And the seven churches in Asia, the seven rungs of the ladder of Jacob, all of these are symbols of the soul. For man striving or climbing to security ascends through the levels of his own soul, and by the energies thereof, as uh, we find, of course, in the uh, that divine commander of Hermes. Now, in one more point, we must develop our theme, and that is that we must refer to and mention uh, the numerative power and the relation of the soul to the concept of number, thus getting ourselves right straight back into Pythagoras and uh, explaining certain points. The soul, according to Plato and Pythagoras, is a number because of its own essential nature. It is, by substance and being, an ogdoad or the power of the number eight. The soul is called the number eight for several reasons, and when we discuss the meaning of numbers a little later, we will go into that phase of it. But the soul has seven powers which are in themselves invisible, and it has an eighth power which is tangible, known by the Greeks as the seminal power or the power of reproduction. So the soul energizes man in seven ways within himself and also bestows upon him its eighth power, which is fertility. All of these, then, are the essential numbers of the soul. As an ordoad, or a magnificent mathematical pattern, the soul is a phase or is an exposition of the concept contained in the Greek of the numerative soul of being. We've already mentioned the numerative soul. The numerative soul is that which bestows number. And in the Greek philosophy, every phase of the soul's energization is by means of number. And it can bestow, therefore, all numbers within itself which are the numbers one to eight. But it cannot bestow the nine, which is the number of man, nor can it bestow the ten, which is the number of being. Therefore, the soul falls short of the totality of man and of being. Yet, being superior to man, by nature and generation, why does it fall short of man? It falls short of man because the soul exists for a reason. And that reason, having been perfected in man, the soul dies and the man does not. This is uh, one of the formulas in the Greek problem. Uh, the verbum, or the word, which was an ancient term for the soul. Uh, we are reminded of the lines of an English poet, never the world of its pain be made whole, till the word made flesh be the word made soul. The word or the verbum, with its seven power, creates a certain thing. It does so, it is said, by spreading seed in space. The soul accepts the seed and warms it, and brings it to life. And having perfected it as a parent, has the same relation to offspring as a physical parent. Actually, every child is the parent of the man. Every generation, every form of life, should by nature excel its own parental cause. 
so because it is the nurse of bodies and of minds, brings them to maturity in order that they may excel it. So what is the only way in which a self-moving energy can be expelled? And the Greeks said that the only reason and the only method by which it can be expelled is because it is potentially moving about an unmoved center which is being itself. Man is capable of releasing being or being released into being. Therefore, soul is inferior to the, perfect, to the perfection of potential man because man is capable of re-identification with conscious godhood and beyond and above the power of the soul is the fact that like the Soka, the mysterious myth of the dying God, the Savior God always dies for the salvation of man and the soul is the Savior God that dies that man may be saved. Now the mystery of that is the attitude which the Pythagoreans reduced to a simple fact. That which is eternal is immovable. Therefore, before the restatement or the completion of all things, they must become immovable. And they cannot be immovable unless the soul, which is motion, voluntarily relinquishes its power over them. Thus, that which is to achieve or to attain must transcend the power of the soul. The power of the soul is thought, emotion, and energy. It is love and hate, good and bad, life and death. It is all things, but perhaps of all the great philosophic systems, none greater or more exactly than in the case of Buddhism, points out how all of the polarities of existence must be overcome before that which is mortal can become immortal. For nothing that moves can be eternal. And the mathematical concept of this is that finally all motion must be. And in the complete cessation of motion, you have the state of eternal reality. Now this leads us to a very interesting thing. Because in the material world, when a thing stops moving, it is dead. In the invisible world, when a thing stops, stops moving, it is God. So uh, you have your two, your positive and negative polarities. Devonus Deus inversus. That which is below is evil, above is good. And in this uh, philosophy of these people, the cessation of all motion is only possible in what uh, Buddha called the Mahaparanabhana, the dying out of the three fires. And the three fires are the three powers of the soul. Kill them too soon and you destroy all. Keep them alive too long and you frustrate all. This pattern leads, of course, to the great disciplines of these schools. Namely, the gradual development within man of the impulse to break the pattern of motion. And to break the pattern of motion, he must transcend motion. And to transcend it, he must first climb upon it, build upon it, unfold everything that there is in it, and then cast it aside. Now, in the casting of it aside, he does not damage or injure soul, which being of itself a creation of the divine nature simply returns to it again. But in the transcendence of motion, 
the individual must annihilate good and evil, life and death, pain and pleasure, increase and decrease. He must achieve a condition of absolute equilibrium, which is the end of motion. Therefore, the soul, when it has achieved the fullest expression of its activity, <coughs> achieves equilibrium. And in so doing, it ceases. Because it cannot move when it has reached absolute balance. And when it cannot move, it ceases. Because it is motion. So soul exists only through the period of strife. Soul only exists while things must grow, improve, become, enlarge, increase. Just as we say, for example, philosophically or symbolically, the alchemical adage of thought, that ultimately man would possess the elixir of life and live forever. Thus he would outwit the two great polarities, life and death. He would remain forever in the full vigor of his years. Therefore, he would um, again not with the polarities youth and age. He would never be sick. Therefore, he would outwit the polarities of health and sickness as polarized factors in his existence. The adept who lived forever was also supposed to live in a perfect world, the golden age to come, in which nothing suffered, nothing sickened, nothing died in which the streets were paid with something resembling gold, and uh, you could draw all the money you wanted out of the bank without putting any in. There have been a great many uh, concepts of what constituted the golden age. To most people, it's the time when they stop work forever and enjoy themselves and have no want and live in a glorious socialized paradise in which everyone is equal except themselves and they are superior. <laughs> That is, uh, that, is, uh, uh, that is a concept. But there will be no sorrow there. There will be no parting there, which is almost another say, way of saying no polarity. Now this condition, which lies in the subconscious symbolic patterning of the human being, is obviously a static state. And we are warned against such states as being most destructive in our thinking and in our conduct, because we must be active, not passive. Yet our total concept of existence is foreverness of peace and happiness. We know, for example, that no one could ever be happy forever in a polarized universe. The individual could not be forever content in a sphere of action and reaction. The achievement of these totalities must come from the suspension of motion, both quantitative and qualitative. He can never attain it while there is an interval between himself and reality, for example. For as long as this interval exists, he is ignorant of something. And as long as he is ignorant of something, he is miserable over something. He can never attain these ends except by the absolute suspension of polarized existence. Motion must cease. Motion ceases in its own source. Wherever motion ceases, in form, we say death sets in, which is disintegration, and we regard it as a most unhappy circumstance, even though disintegration itself is full of motion. But the philosophic death of adeptship or of the nirvana is the absolute transcendence of motion. That condition in which being is reaffirmed and all growth of man in nature is positive. Because ultimately, the only reason why he seeks beauty is because beauty in itself, because of its complete orderliness, is a diminution of motion. 
Where there is beauty, there is no conflict. Where there is no conflict, there is no exhaustion. So gradually, by eliminating all deficiency and reducing all superabundance, the end of the entire program must always be equilibrium. And equilibrium means that the soul, having brought all parts of the nature into perfect order, that its primary purpose, which wants to move toward order, having been fulfilled, no more motion is possible. Because there is no more motion conceivable beyond the ultimate move by which a being is re-identified with being itself. Being is not immovable, but it is with complete suspension of motion. Therefore, it is the unmoved mover of all other things. And that which is unmoved, as Buddha says, in pain or pleasure, that which is itself superior to quality, or condition, gradually rises triumphant over the mystery of soul. And in this, psychology is also deficient. For while obviously, and beyond any question of doubt, such a state as we described is an ultimate, remote to us, and not to be conceived, for an incredible period of time, either historically or psychologically. Still, all things are either leading in the direction of ultimate or are opposing this direction. Therefore, if re-identification with the suspension of motion is the ultimate state which nature has desired for man, and which therefore is the ultimate good for man, regardless of how he may look at it, then man's goal should be with this recognition or realization somewhere within his own being. And he should recognize the moral value and the ethical significance of integration away from conflict and that unification or the bringing together of divided parts is an essential purpose of his own nature. Motion exists only until this ultimate union has been achieved. And in a state of ultimate union, there is no longer motion. Because things which are one neither separate from each other nor come together. And as motion must involve these processes, quantitatively or qualitatively, motion is transcendent. Now we refine motion and emotion. We say, for example, that we will redeem passion and transform it into a gentler emotion, compassion. What is a gentler emotion? Less motion more quality of motion and less quantity of motion. And when motion becomes all quality and no quantity, it becomes immovable. Thus perfection is a complete suspension not only of motion but of the need for it. For things having been brought into their primordial and archetypal form, in which the distances between center and circumference are equal everywhere. And these distances themselves have been absorbed and annihilated by the dominance of being. Then there is neither going nor coming. There is neither approaching nor departing. The great life of man is a motion of approaching reality. Motion ceases when the end is reached. No man runs after he has won the race. And yet no man there stops until the race is run. The soul, therefore, gives us the power to win the great race of life. It gives us the means and the energies required to transform and transmute all of the elements and substances of our compound nature 
refining them, causing us gradually uh, to outgrow their grosser parts. And furthermore, by soul, permeating all of the elements and substances of body, thereby hastening also their own growth. For just as surely as man is warm for the sun and is nourished thereby, each cell in the human body is warmed by the psychic sun in man. The soul is the nourisher of the atom. It is the vitalizer of all things. The regeneration or release of soul power and the purification of its vibratory pattern therefore bestows growth or evolution upon every cell, atom, and electron of the human body. And in this way, man takes care properly of his own universe. For just as surely as man depends upon an invisible and eternal source for life and strength, looking toward it hopefully and with faith throughout the entire period of his existence. So the population of man, the cells and atoms of his own body, receive their nourishment and nutrition from the compound psychic achievement of himself. He is their son and father. He is their life giver. And as the growth of man proceeds, Great waves of evolution take place within him, and whole orders of life are psychically vitalized. And when he has finished with his psychic energy needs, these energies continue and individualize and bring to perfection every seed which we call a cell within the human body. Thus there is a constant motion of growth. And man, through the improvement of himself, becomes a better god over his creation, just as surely as in space great universal processes are unfolding, bringing man to the destiny for which he was ordained. The soul becomes the life of the little lives that are within us. And as animals have group souls, so the cells in man have a group soul. And that group soul is man himself. Therefore, we are not only little creatures growing, we are gods over lesser lives. And everything that leads also follows, which was another well-known Pythagorean axiom. So man, following the gods, leads the chain of lives that are dependent upon him. Thus, in this process of the soul's energy, its numerational patterns and archetypes. The soul is impressing its own original design upon all things. When they fulfill that design, they move to the suspension of motion and achieve quietude. And the most ancient symbol, probably, of total being is quietude. And at the end of striving comes peace. And the peace is being itself the identification of which is the end of man's psychic struggle. Man can assist this task gently, quietly, and without ex exaggerating his own claims when he begins to realize the importance of order over confusion, begins to recognize the significant task of integrating himself and recognizing that the establishment of law and order within his own nature means for him the gradual unfoldment of the good and the beautiful, and the achievement of the necessary, which is the end of his own psychic quest. In this way, by this type of thinking, we recognize the world soul, which is the source of all animate things, all things containing the principle of the anima. We recognize that the world is really a vast soul embodied in matter, that this soul is sprouting forth everywhere, that the meadows of flowers which we see are nothing more or less than soul power breaking through the earth, that the very earth itself with its infinite number of crystals and forms and structures which can be studied microscopically, and uh, the wonderful patterns of crystals and these things 
are also souls, in also in another way, bursting in the rock, it's in the earth itself. And then as these trees and growing things begin to move, an enormous wave of animal life is again soul bursting into motion, into plumage, into color, into wonderful and innumerable sounds and music and harmony. And finally, this bursting forth of soul reaches man. Man discovers fire, builds shelter. Man begins to trace images of his thoughts upon the surface of rocks. Gradually, over a vast length of time, this soul which was in nature becomes in man. And this soul moves him, moves him to build better civilizations, moves him to release power, moves him to invent and create, moves him to move on from the simple primitive life of the aboriginal being to the poet, the musician, the composer, the great artist. All these manifestations are soul moving triumphantly on. Now you might think that this tremendous motion of soul would lead on and on and on until like Kipling we would be making our paintings with brushes of comet tails. But that is not the way it goes. Because as this great motion goes on, on and on, into greater and more superior levels of soul energy. This great motion, like Tao, which is a good symbol for it in China, slowly fades out. It fades gradually away when there is no longer anything that is left that is necessary. So on the brink of the conclusion of necessity, the soul which is the servant of necessity and keeps moving the wheel of necessity goes to sleep in the fulfillment of all things that have been well done. The soul goes to rest in the great psychic field of nature, and its materials are available for other souls growing <coughs> on and on. The soul carries the being across the great interval, but having brought this being to the shore of achievement, it does not result in an infinite achievement. It does not spread achievements from one end of space to the other. Nor will it end in someone who can conquer the whole solar system and rule it from a blazing comet or a sun. This is not the end. Because the end of great soul power is exactly as we find it in the lives of the great teachers. We find Buddha who achieved a magnificent power of soul understanding. A simple, quiet man who went to sleep beside the Indian road. We find Pythagoras and Plato, all these men becoming less and less demanding of life, less and less concerned over what we call achievement, less and less entire, inclined to blaze their way in history. They simply were content to prepare themselves for the great mystery of going home into quietude. So the blazing comes while the soul is in its middle part. But as it achieves its greater good, it seeks quietude, seeks peace, and gives up phenomenal action, and finally comes totally to rest in the eternal being from which it came. So soul is ever also being liberated for from conditions. For when all souls have finished their path, then soul itself goes to sleep in the infinite and is one with it again. And this to a great degree is expressed in the northern Buddhistic system in the story of the Bodhisattva. For this great being, the enlightened soul, cannot enter the nirvana until all other creatures have attained. And when all other creatures have attained, then the Bodhisattva also enters into the great peace. And the Bodhisattva, as the soul, must continue to labor until all creatures, through the use of its motions and energies, have attained. And when they have all attained, then all motion ceases, and the power of the Bodhisattva is restored to the infant.